Hi, my name is Christopher Penn, co-founder and chief data scientist to TrustInsights.ai, and this is the Intelligence Revolution. Fair warning, these slides are current as of June 8th, and they will be expired after June 29th. The field is moving that quickly. You can't go a day without running into some headline about generative artificial intelligence, such as ChatGPT, uh, Dolly, and many of the other uh, generative AI tools that are available on the market. If you're not familiar, if you've not heard of these things, uh, this is an example. Uh, this is what ChatGPT looks like in its current incarnation. And these tools are popping up everywhere. We see that in Google with Google's BARD uh, AI, even in Google search with generative search results where a conversational AI now is making search results for you. We see this, of course, in Microsoft's Bing and even in desktop applications like GPT for All, which allows you to run a model uh, open source locally. And you even see it in tools like Adobe Photoshop. This is Adobe Photoshop's generative fill where we can extend images and make them fit sort of the theme of the existing imagery. When we're talking about generative AI, you'll hear the term model a lot. Model is just fancy for software. Microsoft Word, for example, is software written by humans for humans. A model is AI software written by AI for AI. And the reason you need to know this is because there are things that are interfaces to models like ChatGPT, Bing, Bard, Photoshop. And then there are the underlying models themselves, GPT-4, Palm, Firefly, Llama, etc. And knowing which is which helps to make things more clear in your communications. So what are these? What is a large language model? Everything begins with this phrase from John Rupert Firth in 1957, in which he said, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. This is the basis on which these language models all work. Let's say I take the sentence, I'm brewing the tea. Now, for English speakers, it should be pretty clear what I'm talking about. I'm talking about making a beverage using hot water and dried leaves of a plant. If I change one word, the entire sentence changes meaning, right? If I say I'm spilling the tea, this is now slang for gossip, right? Changing the word uh, brewing to spilling changed the meaning of the word tea. And this is the basis of how language itself works and how large language models work. So how do these things work? How are these things made? Well, there's a 2017 paper that goes into extensive technical detail, and we're not going to talk about most of that uh, today. We're going to talk instead just briefly about the, the high-level pieces. First, technology companies like OpenAI or Google take enormous amounts of text from everywhere they can get it, any place that they can scrape on the web, uh, and take that text and essentially turn it into numbers, right? All these places, reviews, articles, blog posts, it's all distilled down into numbers. And these numbers are then analyzed by software to come up with statistical probabilities about what the next number in a sequence would be. So, for example, if you gave these machines a starting piece of text, I'm brewing the, based on all the numbers around it, based on all the previous words, a machine would have a series of choices to make about what the next logical word would be. If you had just mentioned, say, jasmine or oolong, chances are the machine is going to probabilistically pick tea. If you had just mentioned Starbucks in the previous paragraph, it's going to pick coffee. If you mentioned Karl Marx in the previous paragraph, probably going to pick the fall of capitalism. The words around a word help determine what the next word is going to be. And that's what these language models do. They are just predicting what the next logical term is. To use these language models, we do what is called prompt engineering, which is essentially programming in plain language, right? For example, that's suppose I gave, uh, in this case, the GPT model, I gave it a, a prompt, write a short paragraph about marketing strategy for agencies. And it spits out, you can see here, a, a nice, very generic paragraph. It's so generic because I didn't give it many words to begin with. So it has to come up with its probabilities on its own. And these are the most probable terms. The most probable terms are also the most, most generic. Right? They're the least engaging. 
if I give it a few more words, I say write a short paragraph about marketing strategy uh, for agencies focused on lead generation for agencies using digital marketing strategies and tactics, especially social media. Now, remember, this is just combinations of numbers uh, for that the machine is putting together. It has more to work with. And therefore, it can create a more focused paragraph. It now starts talking about social media and things like that, Facebook ads and LinkedIn ads, etc. Now, suppose I add even more detail. You are an award-winning marketing expert, agency marketing expert. You know agency marketing, marketing for agencies, lead generation, demand generation, B2B marketing, B2B agency marketing, brand building. Your first task is to outline an agency marketing strategy for a B2B marketing agency. Focus on lead generation through the use of unpaid social media strategies and tactics. Recommend specific social networks and specific social media marketing strategies. Use the buyer's journey as a framework, awareness, consideration, evaluation, and purchase. Write in a warm professional tone of voice write a short paragraph there's so many more words in the prompt now that let a machine determine the probabilities of what the next word should be and of course the result here is a much more robust specific detailed result the key takeaway from understanding prompt engineering is that the more relevant words you use in the prompt the better your prompts will perform the better your results will be and this is a skill in and of itself. Uh, there are companies now that are paying enormous sums of money to people who have a background in generative artificial intelligence and can write intelligent prompts um, so that they can, they can get what they want out of these models, right? This is really important stuff. If you want the ability to get the models to do what you want, you've got to write great prompts. There's a prompt worksheet, a prompt uh, guide that we published on our website. It's go to trustinsights.ai slash prompt sheet. No forms to fill out. Just grab the PDF. No strings attached. But this will walk you through the steps of how to build really great prompts. So let's talk about these uh, large language models and the use cases for them. There's six broad categories. Generation, extraction, summarization, rewriting, classification, and question answering. And let's talk about each of these in the context of things like agency marketing and the tasks that you're required to do for clients. We'll start with generation. This is one everyone is familiar with, right? Just make something, make an article, make a blog post, make an email. The tools are reasonably capable at this. The challenge, of course, is writing good prompts to get what you want, as we just saw. But this is one, one example, uh, writing an outline for agency marketing strategy. Another example, uh, this is writing a privacy policy for a website. Given the a series of technologies and the requirements, um, these tools can very capably generate uh, even legal texts. Now, I strongly encourage you to make sure that you consult with a real lawyer to, to validate the results. But the results I've gotten from these tools so far have been excellent. They can even write code, right? You give uh, the tools some directions uh, and you give them an outline of what you want the code to do and it will generate code, which is an enormous time saver. The second set of tasks is extraction, the ability to take information out of the data that they're given. For example, I said you're a B2B SEO expert. Here's a summary of uh, what my company is about. Extract out keywords for SEO. And I also asked it to include keywords that are semantically related, even if they're not in the source text. And it does uh, a very capable job of extracting that information out. Another example, one of my favorites and one that is a, a goldmine for agencies is call transcription. You give a one of these tools a... Uh, tr a raw transcript, usually AI generated, of a conference call with a client, and you say, make a, a list of meeting notes and action items. This will save you hours per week, hours per week of uh, note taking and stuff on calls, and you'd be even better at creating completeness, completeness with your client calls so that you don't miss things. You can have it extract links from web pages if you want to see uh, all the links on a page, for example. The third category is summarization, condensing text down. This is, again, such a powerful set of tools. I did a series of 20 interviews with different stakeholders uh, within an organization about what they thought the brand of the organization was about. And then I fed all 20 into a language model and said, summarize this, uh, boil all these down to a single mission statement. So here it's doing some management consulting and coming up with a very good, straightforward mission statement. Voice of the customer is really important. This is a social media marketing example. I took all the five-star reviews of the Boston Martial Arts Center's uh, reviews on Google Business and said, 
Now generate Instagram captions and photos based on this text. And this is so important that we're using the words and phrases that are coming out of our customers' mouths and not what we think the customer uh, should hear about us, right? So we are truly using the voice of the customer. Very, very powerful tool for creating social media content. We can even do uh, things like writing out a, a summary of our brand statement, what our, our company is about. I gave the, the tool, I said, uh, extract a comprehensive summary of what Trust Insights is about from our own website and went and browsed the website and it condensed down all the stuff that we say about ourselves into one very short summary. Very, very helpful for understanding our brand and competitor brands. Rewriting is the fourth set of tasks that these things are really good at. Uh, this is an example. I got an NDA from someone and <laughs> it was so bad. I'm like, did, did you like, copy this off the internet? And the answer was yes, of course they did. And it was not good. So I said, rewrite this to uh, make sure that it is sufficient, that it does all the things an NDA should. And of course, it rewrote it. And when I handed it off to a human lawyer, they're like, okay, you can sign this version. The previous version definitely should not sign. Uh, for social media marketing strategy, sometimes we'll see a really interesting paper, academic paper or an engineering paper about social networks and we're not sure what to do with it. Here's an example. Here's uh, the, the engineering blog post about Twitter's algorithm that they published. I said, write a social media strategy based on the contents of the paper, rewriting the paper in terms of a social media marketing strategy. So translating high tech language into practical terms that we can use. And one of my favorite examples, sometimes you just want to say something, but you know you can't say it professionally. So in this case, uh, I said, rewrite the following memo in a professional tone. Bob, you sent over two months of invoices in one day. Of course, it's not done. It's not going to be done anytime soon because this takes time. And if you needed it soon, you shouldn't let it sit on your desk for two weeks. You can write off and you'll get it when you get it. Go yourself, Karen in accounting. And of course, it spits out, dear Bob, I hope this message finds you well. Right? This is rewriting what we actually want to say into a tone that maybe is is more professional a very very powerful use case it, it this is a fun example but this is a very real example of how you can use these tools the fifth set of category of tasks is classification taking data and classifying it so you could give uh these tools uh, blog posts for example and say what are the topics that these are about if you're doing any kind of media research uh trying to understand what a writer writes about maybe for public relations purposes this is a gold mine to quickly classify a lot of content uh, you can even take stuff like correspondence with people and run personality analysis to understand who is this person uh, this is an example from a series of emails I received. Uh, and I had it write out what that person's personality is. Imagine the use cases for like your sales and business development folks. You get some emails from a prospective client. You can quickly understand what is that client's point of contact's personality and assign the right salesperson. Or maybe when you start working with the client, you use this to understand your team's personalities and your client's personalities and match the right people to the right client. The sixth task uh, is question answering. And this is one that people use these tools a lot for. They are not search engines. Well, except for the ones that are actually search engines like Bing, for example. Um, but people use the, the tools like ChatGPT as search engines. Here's a, a good example. Um, given a scenario, what social network should I be on if I want to reach uh, industrial concrete folks? And of course, the tool is able to synthesize an answer to this question. Now, this is not content generation per se. This is just answering questions. But these tools are very capable of answering questions for which they have knowledge. So this all sounds great, right? These are amazing tasks. We should immediately go and just implement these everywhere, right? Maybe not. Uh, there are some downside risks to these tools. Number one is bias. Right? There is a lot of bias in these, in these tools because they are comprised of language that was scraped from all over the web and the web is representative of all people uh, including points of view and terms and language but we might not find uh, appropriate in a, in a professional context from open ai they said for example we found that our models more strongly associate european american names with positive sentiment when compared to african american names and negative stereotypes with black women if you use a tool like this in say a chat bot on your website you could run into a situation where 
Linda gets a very different response than Letitia does, and they should get the same response. They should be treated equally, but these tools could potentially make that not happen. So something to be aware of and be actively looking for. There are copyright issues unresolved in the courts of law yet. Um, on the intake side, these tools have scraped an enormous amount of copyrighted works. Now, those works are not in these tools. They are not in there word for word. The probabilities of words in those works are what's in these tools. But there is still the issue. That does a company like OpenAI have permission to use this data? They do not currently, and that has not been resolved in the court of law. On the output side, it has been resolved so far in, in, from the U.S. Copyright Office in the USA that AI-generated works are ineligible for copyright. And they're ineligible for copyright because a human being did not create them. The law states pretty clearly and has been resolved in past cases that only humans may claim copyright. There's a famous case of a chimpanzee that took a selfie. The photographer tried to copyright the work and the courts ruled, nope, the chimpanzee is not human and therefore the photo is in the public domain. So be aware of that. And third, there are a lot of discussions happening about how to regulate this stuff. Um, most of those discussions are going to be fruitless and we can pretty much guarantee that at least in the USA, which is where I am based, um, Whatever legislation and regulation they do come, up, do come up with will be largely ineffective because that just seems to be how politicians work. So let's talk about how you're going to roll these things out, how you're going to scale their use. And four stages, prompt engineering, prompt deployment, fine-tuning at public models, and then fine-tuning private models. Um, prompt engineering first. We talked about what it is. You are going to be using these tools a lot, um, especially as they get integrated into all sorts of different places. So getting good at prompt engineering is going to be really important. If you work with sensitive data, uh, sensitive protected information, highly regulated information, there are tools like gpt for all that run locally on your computer. And those are the tools you will be using for any of that sensitive data. So if you have to uh, do stuff with, say, you know, medical information, Tools like this don't send data anywhere. Um, they never leave your laptop. And so that's the kind of things you'll be looking at. These tools are getting integrated into everything. So here's an example of Microsoft Visual Studio Code. With one right click on my code, I can say inspect this code and make it better or fix these bugs. Later in 2023, Microsoft will be rolling out Copilot both to its Windows operating system itself and to Microsoft Office to be able to do things like create a slide presentation from a press release, uh, for example. The most important thing you can do right now is start building a prompt library in your organization, a collection of the prompts that work best for you and your company and, and what you do both in your job individually and as a team and protect your prompts. Remember, this is code. Even though it looks like plain language. It looks like that memo you sent around the office asking people not to microwave fish in the break room. This is code and you have to protect this code as like it was written by a programmer. Like it was you know, programming code because it's that valuable. So don't go sharing your prompts willy nilly. This is code that you're writing. Once you've gotten a library of really good prompts, you'll want to start thinking about how do we use these at scale to take them into a developer environment, start testing them, and then rolling them out. Here's an example. I wrote one for sentiment analysis that worked so well, I added it to some uh, R programming language code so that it can do this at scale on thousands of articles instead of you know one at a time. The machines can do this. This sort of glues together our prompts into much bigger engines. So if you've got a set of prompts that work really well, you're going to want to codify them into real programming code. The third step in your evolution is going to be fine-tuning models. This is where you are going to take one of these models and make it do more of a specific task. Uh, you'll do things like take your training data, for example, all of the blog posts that my CEO and partner, Katie Robert, wrote. And as we said, we're going to take this and make the model talk more like her. So we extract all these blog posts, process them with uh, the appropriate tools, and load it into the system. And unlike prompts, this perfectly captures her voice, the style of her writing and so well. And the more fine-tuned the model is, the shorter your prompts need to be to still get great results. You're, you're essentially creating custom versions of these models that do exactly what you want for one specific type of task. Finally, 
going to fine tune some private models. This would sort of be the, the, the highest level of evolution. You're going to take these models um, and maybe for highly regulated industries, you're going to build something that is custom, that is your secret sauce for how you're using AI. For example, the company Bloomberg took 41 years of their transaction data from their Bloomberg terminal system and fine-tuned a custom in-house model that can pick stocks. Now, it can't write poetry or write song lyrics, but boy, can it pick stocks. That's sort of the evolution, the, the ends the evolution of these tools. The key message here, though, is that everyone, including you, is a developer. The moment you start writing a prompt, you are now a developer and all what that uh, encompasses. So how is this going to impact marketing? What is this going to do to marketing? Well, a few things. First, this is going to dramatically change search. We're already seeing this, right? We're already seeing search summaries. Look at this one about my company, Trust Insights. There's nothing to click on here, right? There's a few things to click on in Bing. There's nothing to click on in ChatGPT. There's nothing to click on in uh, GPT for all. So we're going to lose search traffic, and we're especially going to lose unbranded search traffic. Um, where people are asking more informational queries. Here's an example from Bard. What are some good resources to learn more about B2B marketing? And they list a bunch of things, but again, there's nothing to click on here. There's nothing to do. It's just a list of information. Again, Bing gives you some things to click on, but not many. This is you know, your top three search results. So from an SEO perspective, if you're not in the top three on Bing, you're, you're definitely not getting any attention. Chat GPT does, doesn't give us any love. And of course, the private tools certainly uh, don't do that either. You will start to see more plugins, uh, the ability for people to use uh, integrations and browse the web live, but don't count on that for search traffic. And you will see those search agents more and more in your Google Analytics, for example. So the most important thing you can do, the key takeaway here, is to look at your search data in Google Search Console or Bing Webmaster Tools and count up how much search that you get is branded versus unbranded. Branded search you'll probably hold on to for a while. Unbranded search, that's going to go away really, really fast. So you need to have a backup plan. What is that backup plan? Well, there's three parts to it. The first, you need to build your brand. Invest a lot of time in brand building so that people remember who you are because that's going to be the only way you get uh, some traffic. Second, you need some form of marketing that is disintermediated, that is direct to your audience. No one's AI in the way. So not search-based, not social media-based, right? Facebook, for example, uh, or LinkedIn, they are, they're always things that they're recommending that are not you. But an email newsletter, that is a direct connection between you and your audience. A text messaging line is a direct connection between you and your audience. Even, even direct mail, right? Mailing something to somebody's house, that is a way to get around other people's AI. And the third thing you're going to need is a community. Again, some place that you can gather that is not intermediated by AI. This is an example of our Slack group, Analytics for Marketers, uh, which is, you know, again, it's a chronological private social media network. And if you want to join it, um, there's a, you can actually join, go to uh, trustinsights.ai slash analytics for marketers. It's free to join. But you need a community of some kind that you can, again, directly talk to your audience with, without someone's technology in the way. Now, let's talk about careers. The number one question people have, who's going to lose their jobs? The Brookings Institute said a while back that AI will take away tasks, not jobs. And this is true, but not the whole picture. Here's the reality. A worker who is skilled at AI will take the job of a worker who is not. A worker who is skilled at AI will take the job of a worker who is not because the, the, you know, there's so much more you're capable of. Take your average work day, right? As you start to auto automate away more and more tasks, you're going to have a, a utilization rate in your company and your agency that looks like this. Now, a forward-thinking agency will, of course, uh, reskill and upskill those folks to make them even more productive. A regressive, less forward-looking agency will say, well, we can just downsize. We don't need nearly as many people. And this is happening in the industry. In uh, early May, the Writers Guild of America went on strike in 14 minutes, 14 minutes after that strike was announced. People were getting inquiries uh, from studios needing writers to write some dialogue, right? That is so fast, so fast that less forward-thinking companies are just going to try and replace as many people as possible. So your mission statement as a career professional is to get skilled at AI so that your job remains safe. <clears throat> Finally, let's talk about what's next, what's around the corner. 
first autonomous AI. Machines are have going from individual instances essentially to like offices filled with virtual people. Uh, this is an example of Agent GPT that is given a very complex task and breaks it down and then goes and tries to complete that task on its own, including writing its own code, running its own code, doing all sorts of stuff that um, the original models can't do alone. So they, they, these ensembles of models that can are very, very powerful. Someone even reinvented the video game The Sims, but it's all run by AI. The game essentially plays itself and it's coherent. Yeah. Um, Imagine doing this with like a virtual uh, focus group. That'd be pretty cool. Second, these tools are becoming more and more multimodal by the day, from writing sheet music to being able to read images and understand them. This is an example. I gave it some Google Analytics data and it interpreted it. To even be able to create, go look up uh, Pepperoni Hug Spot on YouTube for an amusing, purely AI-generated ad that right now is pretty janky. It's pretty uh, clunky, but you can see the potential. And brands have noticed Coca-Cola just released a generative AI uh, commercial of their own called the Coca-Cola Masterpiece that is part regular editing and part AI generated. These tools are becoming open source. We're seeing more and more models that are being released by the open source community that enable uh, companies to be able to embed these tools now on their devices and not have to pay exorbitant fees to uh, the big tech companies. We are seeing ecosystems popping up, individual models that have very specific use cases. I saw one the other day called Karen the Editor that just does uh, text editing for books and things. It doesn't do any of the other stuff that's finely tuned. Even within a tool like ChatGPT, we now have the plugin store where these plugins are available to do very specific tasks that the original tool can't do. We are seeing synthetic marketing showing up. Um, I don't have the audio for this uh, right now, but... Um, I basically can clone someone's voice and have it read out text in their voice with exceptional accuracy. Imagine having a client who does it, who wants a podcast, but doesn't want to spend the time doing a podcast. You get their permission to record some samples uh, and you get uh, their approval on scripts. And then you have the machines essentially read the podcast script right out loud. And it sounds like them. These machines are also now exhibiting true creativity. Uh, there are projects like Dream GPT, which take the mistakes that these tools make, the mistakes, and turn those mistakes into content, into ideas, in, this, in a way that is similar to how human creativity functions. Finally, we are seeing AI show up everywhere. As we talked about earlier, Photoshop has this Unity, the video game creation software, is adding generative AI to be able to give prompts to their tools and create entire virtual worlds with little to no technical skill. It's going to change not only the video game industry, but the motion picture industry as well, because the engines are so photorealistic that they will be able to create amazing motion picture sequences that look um, terrific. They look terrific um, just with text-based prompts. So some final thoughts as we close out. Everyone is a developer. The moment you write your first prompt, you are a developer. Everything now is software because as Andre Karpathy, uh, founder, co-founder of OpenAI, said at the beginning of this year, the hottest programming language in 2023 is plain language. He said it was, it was English, but it's plain language. Right? Everything is software, which means that every word you write is an opportunity. If you have questions about what we've talked about, um, those are obviously the Q&A, but if you want to stay in touch or ask questions maybe specific to your uh, use cases, here's the contact information. Feel free to grab a screen grab and stuff of this. You'll also get a copy of the slides as well. Thank you for watching. I look forward to talking to you soon.